Energy media readers, many of you live in rural Alberta, and I've heard from a number of you about how concerned you are about changes to rural health care. Physician compensation has been a huge issue, but also the availability of doctors and, and health care in general, especially in the midst of a pandemic. To discuss that issue today, we've got Dr. Ed uh, Aceman, uh, who practices in the Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain House area and is, run, is head of the rural section in the Alberta Medical Association. Uh, and we've got uh, Dr. Jill Conkin, who's a professor at the University of Alberta. So welcome doctors. Thank you for having us. Well, it's a pleasure to do this because, and, and I have to say, uh, I'm usually an energy journalist and I don't venture into healthcare much, but this is the, the getting the right information out about, uh, about uh, medical practices during a pandemic and then all of the controversies surrounding uh, health policy in Alberta. Uh, I know my readers are saying, you know, we need something. We need to know what's going on. Can you get us a couple of experts to talk to it? So I thank you very much for you two coming on, and uh, Ed, we're gonna start with you. And can you walk us through, give us a, a brief explanation of the changes to physicians' comp compensation, and particularly how that's affected uh, rural physicians, because we've seen some of them resign their hospital privileges, been very controversial. So it was uh, in the fall of last year that the government has started negotiations with the Alberta Medical Association, and that was, uh, what commonly happens between that type of organization and the government. And what we've seen from the government was they had uh, some idea of some proposals to look at cost savings for the system and the government. Um, when we initially saw those proposals, uh, uh, my comment was that that would hit rural Alberta quite hard. And the reason for that was just the variety of work that we do in rural Alberta. Uh, we do a lot of hospital work, including emergency work and inpatient work, as well as trying to uh, provide a patient's medical home in, in a rural community. And what we had happened with those proposals was they, they would give little cuts and every little bit and all different little pieces. But as you added those cuts up, then that became uh, quite a bit more significant for us as rural physicians. Uh, so I'm not going to say it was the intent of the government to do that, but just how those proposals laid out. My understanding was that the, the cuts were in the neighborhood when you added them all up in around 30%. Is that in the ballpark? Yeah, it would be in the ballpark of that. Maybe in some cases, uh, depending on the position, a little bit more. Um, so the government had the proposals. And then the other part was the rural northern remote program, which we heard about this last weekend a bit more. So all of that kind of added up. And it also added up a lot of uncertainty, both being able to practice and being able to keep doing what you're able to do and that related not just about income loss to keep our clinics running uh, but also physician loss which uh, is probably the bigger issue in rural Alberta because it's such a hard uh, thing to recruit and retain physicians so that was our greater issue. Right and my understanding uh, is that uh, out of the, whatever revenue you get from the government I mean, that's not, doesn't go just into your pocket. You have to keep your office, your clinic going, pay staff, pay rent, and all of those expenses. But 30% cut in revenue would be, I mean, it'd be hard for any business. Yeah, and again, when we look at the 30% cut, that would be, like you said, the gross billings that we do as physicians. And from that, we then have to pay the fees uh, to practice and also keep our clinics running, which is what we call the overhead. Um, that adds up considerably. Uh, it's like any small business, you have rent, you have staff, you have utilities, you have insurance, you have taxes, and so all that does add up, and then there's a cost to that. And so, yeah, hopefully we use the money that we get wisely in our clinics to, to do good work for our patients and keep them healthy, and I think it's important that we recognize that there's a good part of that money that is goes back into the health system, into our clinics and patient care. Now, we've seen a number of uh, physicians have been in the news lately that have uh, resigned their hospital privileges and so on because they just can't afford it. Is, is that directly related to these changes to physician compensation? It certainly was related to the changes in the proposals the government had on physician compensation. Um, in a rural community, um, if you are uh, 
working in the hospital, uh, in the emergency department or, or in surgery or whatever other place you need to be, it might be long-term care, um, you're away from your clinic. And if the income that you earn to pay for the clinic is in the clinic, then that's where you're going to have to be uh, focused on. And so that was part of that. Um, the other part was simply, as we heard in some of our initial uh, as surveys to our members, and a lot of them were talking about calling it an early retirement and possibly leaving the province to look elsewhere. And that was more of it. So that becomes a sustainable part. Um, as you have less physicians, and if you're trying to keep the emergency going, you'll spend even less time in your clinic uh, as a result. So last night I was on call. I worked since yesterday morning about seven o'clock to, well now, and uh, you know, so I've really been in the clinic a brief part of that time. And you know, I still need to make sure the staff are there for the next day that I show up at the clinic and that the utilities and the bills are paid. Wow. Uh, I work a lot of hours, but I, don't, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't do that punishing schedule. Uh, Jill, I've got a couple of questions for you. And uh, you and I were talking about government policy, health policy. And you made a couple of points that I thought was really interesting. And that is that uh, the first one is that the, you know, governments, when they change policies, usually go out and consult uh, physicians and other professionals and, you know, and seek their feedback and, and so on. But it seems like the, the current government uh, is not doing that uh, at all, or maybe not enough. Am I, have I got that correct? Um, I th it, I would say it's even broader than that. So yes, um, uh, health policy is a, a quite a wicked problem, and um, tinkering in one spot uh, often has unintended consequences. Unless you're really sort of doing a very major systematic look at things, um, I would argue that. Um, where the cons consulting needs to start is with the community. That if we're working towards a socially accountable health system, that being socially accountable means that you're meeting the priority health concerns of the communities you serve um, with those priorities being determined with the community, not by the system alone. So that would be number one. But the other piece is talking to the people who actually work in the system. And this wouldn't just be physicians. It's nurses, it's respiratory techs, it's the LPNs. It's most of those people that are part of the system have lots of ideas about how to make things work better and um, kind of uh, help the system function in a way that serves the communities. So the, that's where I would start on that piece. Now, uh, have previous governments been, you know, getting better on that on that front? Uh, and then this government went, bent back, went backwards? That, that's my impression of it. That may not be correct. Or, you know, is this government just in a long line of, you know, they haven't been great at planning policy? I, uh, I don't think there's a a big generalizable answer to that, Markham. Um, I lived and worked through the Klein cuts, and there was no consultation. Um, and in fact, that premier finally admitted he had no plan. Um, devastating. And, but what I would observe is having been involved in rural medicine, I'm going to date myself for 30 years plus, that the the people that always lose in these big system determined by government and or the health system itself these changes are almost always rural people that there's all the losses and whatever it's assumed that there can be efficiencies or money saved people don't understand that health health services in communities are actually economic drivers as opposed to economic centers. So that's one key thing. Um, but the other piece is that, and we talked a little bit about this, there's a, a, a growing theory called structural urbanism. And, and it is about building policies and structures and procedures 
around what works in an urban environment and assuming that can be imposed on rural people with, you know, sort of, oh, well, they're just in the same way as it used to be thought that kids were just little adults, you know, rural communities are just little metropolises, which isn't the case. And so the funding mechanisms, the what outcomes are being measured, how they're being measured, the fact that rural is almost always just glommed into urban when you're looking at what health outcomes are, um, all of those things are part of a system that doesn't look at rural in its own right when it needs to. It sounds like to a layman who's looking at it from the, from the outside that the system is broken and needs some repair. Um, what would you, what process would you put in place to begin to repair it, to make the changes that you think are necessary? Or the, Well, I'll say something systematically, and then maybe Ed can come with some of the details. So systematically, I'll go back to the whole socially accountable piece. I am part of, I am a professor in family medicine. I am a rural journalist family doc, or I work for them. I used to be a rural journalist, full-time rural journalist family doc. Um, but system, systematically, what we need is um, a commitment to social accountability. And if you look at a socially accountable system, the people at the table for all of these conversations around the system need to be, obviously, people from the health system, people who make policy and decisions, so the government, professionals, which would be the nurses and the docs and whatever, the academy, and really importantly, the community. And that, you know, I mean, there is that saying that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, and arguably, unless you have those five people or five groups represented, then it's always easy to blame somebody who isn't there. Whereas bringing those people together actually will build something important uh, and Ed, functional. Sure. Uh, Ed, uh Taking what, um, what Jill said about that, how does that apply or could it apply uh, in Rocky Mountain House? So I think when I, when I look at the healthcare system, I, I look at how do all the pieces fit together and how do we value all those pieces and how they work together. So in Rocky Mountain House, uh, what we're trying to do actually is look at the building something I call, and one of my late colleagues would call community resilience which is what can you actually safely do in your community to provide that care so your population actually doesn't have to leave the community. And this became really critical with the loss of actually something as simple as bus service, which helped people get to a larger center. Um, and we're actually seeing a lot of stuff being built uh, kind of around that. So in my community, we also actually travel out as physicians. I go to uh, the First Nation communities of Bighorn, Sunchild, and Ochis, which can be up to an hour away from me heading west. Uh, we've reached out to our, our smaller communities, such as uh, the village of Caroline, to provide physician services there. So how do you keep people from having to travel so much while well, we can do some of the traveling for them? And, but I think we have been seeing this worked at, um, certainly through the Alberta Medical Association, where we uh, get together as rural docs, as family doctors. Uh, we work together to build the concept of the medical Home. And then we work together with specialists. So how do we provide specialist care? And how do we link better in that care? And we're seeing some specialists provide uh, virtual care uh, for our patients uh, so they don't have to come in and, and drive in if they're not able to. So we've got pieces of it going. I think the big thing is how do you maintain that momentum and build on it? And I think as Jill said, how do you evaluate that and really bring out the value of having it? Uh, an integrated healthcare system. If Rocky Mountain House wasn't working and we weren't keeping the emergency department open and keeping inpatient care and, and labor and delivery, where would that be picked up from the system that's already shown to be bulging at the seams in pretty much every larger center? So it is quite critical that rural is looked at as, as a very important part of the system to help offload from the rest of the system while also being important to our patients when they need a higher level of care. So Ed, uh, help us out here. Uh, you know, that we're, so we've got Albertans here who are, you know, uh, 
users of the healthcare system. We've got, we're looking at it from the outside in. Can, uh, can we be reassured that the system is working, uh, that it is, uh, you know, policy changes and whatever system changes that are taking place are for the better? Or because all we've heard for the last, I don't know how many months, is, is these crises that keep coming up. And then, you know, for instance, physician compensation and, and there was a, the controversy around whether uh, a number of communities were not designated anymore as rural. I mean, how do we, I, we're trying to make sense of this. Can you, can you do that within the context of, of your practice? So when I look at what's happening, the controversies that are happening, it's, it's about taking the unilateral approach rather than leadership and consultation, just as Dr. Conklin was saying, uh, talking with the community. I mean, um, when I look at Rocky Mountain House, it, it is a community effort to uh, recruit physicians and retain physicians. We work alongside our communities uh, because we need their help and support in doing that, to, to show off the community, to, to let people know what's available. Uh, while we as physicians are trying to keep the system going and working long hours and, and trying to keep the service going. So it is a complete uh, integration of community that you see a little bit more in rural. Um, and when the government does you little changes, they didn't actually consult the community either. And I think the mayor of Black Bush had really said they worked 10 years to get to where they were and now we're gonna do it all over again. And that's, that's the frustrating part. Uh, so it is a unilateral approach that, that causes problems. Gotcha. Now, my understanding is that you're having trouble. Uh, did I understand you correctly that you've been looking for another associate in your clinic for a long time, couldn't couldn't find one, and this just makes it it makes it harder. We were looking for four of them. Four of them. So we are four. We've been short four physicians. I've been trying to get four physicians, and um, you know, so this does make it harder. Uh, the uncertainty burns doctors out uh, as much as the workload. And I don't think that's appreciated by, by government necessarily. And I think one of the things when Jill was talking about sort of how you build the system, one of the issues comes is, you know, how to make it nonpartisan. And so we look at it for the people of Alberta, not, not, not a partisan type of thing. And we have had actual successful negotiations that were tough cuts. Uh, with the last government, we had the $100 million savings, which added up quite a bit significant. Uh, some of their proposals was going to hurt rural Alberta and actually did. And it adds on to it even to this day. Uh, but at least they consulted us and were able to go back and forth. And I think that's the type of example that we need from government and from policymakers. And we used to have a, a tripart agreement where it was physicians, government, and Alberta Health Services together, which was probably in my mind, it, it, as Jill stated, left out the community, uh, which was very important to have there, but it was trying to bring all the pieces together so that we worked out together. Because if you really want an accountable, sustainable system, uh, we have to look at it as a whole system. It's not just about physician pay or how much Alberta Health Services is spending, it's about what we are doing in the system. And how is that accountable? And how is that responsible? Jill, if, if I can ask you, I, I know you're, as an academic, and you're interested in training and education of, of physicians, do, do the changes that are being made to the system now make it more difficult to recruit physicians and other health healthcare personnel into rural communities and more difficult to train them? Well, if we lose the number of physicians that appear to be on the verge of being lost uh, the whole this is like a house of cards so we are finally uh, in medical education I, I should probably back up and just say changes in medical education take anywhere from like 8 to 12 years to see um, the changes um, and I came to the U of A about 14 years ago and we've put in some programs that are now showing success. Um, and part of that success are communities like Rocky Mountain House and Pincher Creek and Lac La Biche and High Level and whatever. And that it takes a, a stable group of, and it's not just physicians, it's the health team um, to bring up 
the future health professionals, that you need to train where you're going to work. We've, we've had too many years of, again, the structural urbanism. You assume you train people in the city, they'll go anywhere. Well, no, they won't. Um, and we've proven that in spades. And so that's a piece of it. The other thing is, um, and I do remember this from the 90s, I was the president of the Society of Royal Physicians of Canada back in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, but things were not great anywhere in the country. And we were all quite, how shall we say, not so keen. Um, and suddenly realized, well, we're staying in our communities. Why do we stay there? We're committed. We're part of our communities. We want to be there. And if we keep crabbing about this job, who's going to want to join us? Um, and so, you know, there was a, a big turnaround, number one. But part of it is that we know that doctors who teach give better quality care, are happier, and are much more likely to stay in their communities. So this is one of those very synergistic kinds of things that, again, I'll go back to what I said before. You start tinkering with little pieces of something that's a complex system. The unintended consequences will be uh, enormous, ultimately, cause a tsunami somewhere else. So if we're talking about a system with that where you take uh, pieces out of it and then it begins to begins to crumble, uh, so what are some of the pieces that have been taken out of rural health care? Now, compensation, obviously. Uh, what are some of the, the other changes, Joe? So when I look at the healthcare system, what, it's not so much what hasn't been taken out, but what hasn't been there and what needs to be there. And I think Jill alluded to it a little bit there. And I, and I think I want to just add to what Jill's comment is that rural health care as physicians and nursing and everything else has really stepped up to the educational plate. So we are almost critical into the education of medical students where they can come out and actually see patients one-on-one -on -one and actually learn the general part of what medicine is because we're quite general. Um, and then again, the, the education is going on for residents and stuff. And I would say even if they do not return to rural, they at least start to understand rural. And they know where the patients are coming from and, and, and the limitations we have in rural communities. And so I think that's important. Um, now right. I lost my time. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I've got a question for Jill. Uh, so Jill, you were mentioning that uh, in our chat earlier uh, that a lot of people who uh, go to are, are trained in the rural areas, not everybody wants to go back to the city. And the number of doctors are quite happy to take up a practice in, in the rural areas and, and stay there. And, I, and it sounds like the changes that have been made or are coming are discouraging those physicians from doing that? Well, they will. I mean, they're, they're as our, our residents in particular, so the, the students or the learners that are almost ready to be into practice start hearing about the um, shifting sins that people that have been their preceptors and their mentors and their role models are starting to think about leaving rural medicine, then they're going to I mean, they become very anxious and un unsettled. And the other thing is, I think people don't understand that, you know, Alberta, there are most of the people who are educated here come from here in medicine, not all everyone, but that they want to stay here. However, there's a whole big country out there. And the one thing that I don't think anybody really understands is that rural generalist physicians are actually the MacGyvers in medicine that the scope of what rural docs can do is much broader than any other of the physicians. We are in hot demand throughout the country um, and can pretty well say, I want to go, as, if you want to stay rural, then there are lots of places. And if you look at some of the frameworks and the evidence for recruiting, and in particular, retraining or retaining physicians. And this would be the same for nurses and other health professionals. It isn't, this isn't just about physicians, because as you create instability, then you're going to start to lose nurses and, and other of the health professions. But one of the biggest things is work environment. Well, if you have 
um, a system that is starting to assume that you're just replaceable and, you know, it really doesn't matter and the team, who cares, that kind of thing, then th it's, it's a hard enough job, I'm not going to it's an incredibly satisfying job, but it's hard work. But you won't burn out if you have great colleagues, a wonderful team, and feel like you're valued and, and um, that the work you do is understood. And you take those away, people can go anywhere. Uh, before we get into Q&A, which I'd like to do fairly quickly, I'd like each one of you to address this question, but, but briefly. And, and that is, is rural, Alberta rural health care in crisis, on the verge of crisis, uh, just needing some, some work? Where are we at with that? And, and let's start with Jill. Oh, dear. Um, I think we have to say it would depend on, on what piece of that you're looking at. I don't think it's in crisis at the moment. Uh, it, it has been, like if we look at north of the Yellowhead, it has been for physician workforce, but not just physicians. It has been a hard place to recruit and retain. But until this last year and a half or so, there were usually about 30 positions vacant for physicians. I, I don't keep track of the other numbers. And in this last year and a bit, it's gone to 50 plus. I would say that Central Alberta and Southern Alberta are two places that you can look at for the success of the uh, partnership between rural physicians, medical schools, and the health system itself in training physicians to go to those communities. And that the recruitment, I, I gather, Rocky, is still looking. But if you look, in particular, Southern Alberta and some of the Central Alberta communities, places that have been several doctors short for a long time, um, have been filling those positions. And if we can now ask you, are we Crisis, edge of crisis, what's your take? You know, I think it depends on the community at this point in time. Um, certainly in our, our uh, surveys, some, some of the communities are going to be quite devastated. There are some physicians that are leaving the communities, and particularly communities with smaller numbers of physicians, once you lose one or two, it's, it's unsustainable. Um, and so I think that's the big thing. I think, I think the word is still out there. I think, I think we have a chance to save it with, with uh, proper negotiations and working together. And there's a few other things we need to fix in rural health care as well, particularly for privileging and how we look at physicians in communities and what they do. Um, but I think on a, it's going to be on a community, community basis of crisis. And certainly in our work that we've been doing the last bit that's garnished all this interest it's really been about sustaining and, and making sure so you know if communities aren't losing positions that makes me very happy uh, for communities that are losing um it makes me very sad uh, it's been a lot of work to get to where they've been um and we haven't really looked at what the community actually needs and in, in the physician numbers we're just looking at what they have and it doesn't really have brought the community needs in if we've actually looked at that properly yet so i am you know, it's, it's a mix. And there's a lot of uncertainty yet, so I'm not sure. Gotcha. Uh, folks, uh, uh, look now uh, to our audience to, to get some questions. So you can put up your little blue hand, and I'll be happy to call upon you and get you to open up your mic. And while we're waiting for some, some questions, um, the Ed, oh, well, hang on a second. We have one. Uh, Gene, uh, please, if you don't, Unmute your mic and ask your question. Jean Boda. Yeah, talk technology. Um, first of all, thank you, Jill and Ed, for your um, input. Um, this really concerns me. Uh, I'm with the County of Red Deer, but um, this is a cum cumulative effect, right? If you start losing uh, the rural uh, docs and, and health care professionals, then it, then, then it just um, surges into the larger centers. But I, it's interesting, Jill, and you mentioned something, and I, and I never thought of this, but um, I'm involved with a project right now. It's building capacity in rural crime prevention. So um, on some of our steering committees and our advisory committees, we have health officials, um, educators, that kind of stuff. So like you say, uh, with, with the um, 
the uh, people staying in communities, understanding the communities, um, they are able then to be um, to to let us know what problems are going on there. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, right now we have this uh, philosophy that uh, just to get uh, more police, it'll solve the problem. No, it's not. And uh, so I spoke at RMA in November because um, there's four groups, four of us groups that are involved with this project. And it's like, we've got to start looking at the deeper, deeper issues. So as you guys- If I can just interrupt for a sec, could, could you ask your question, please? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to thank you for, for your information. And um, I, Jill, I wouldn't mind getting in touch with you uh, regarding my project. So yeah, thanks, Martha. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Doug Hart, you're up next. Doug? I'll unmute you. Doug's, ha <laughs> Sorry. Doug's having a little technology problem as well. Oh, there you go, Doug. Um, memory problem. Um, you talked about the importance of approaching this from a nonpartisan perspective. Uh, what everybody seems to understand is e the economics of our situation. Rural Alberta is the economic engine of the province. We provide yeah. uh, about 90% of our export uh, dollars come right out of small communities. And uh, everybody understands that we need to, it, it might cost a little more to provide a social infrastructure for those communities to continue to drive the economy. And I think we need to put pressure on the government to remind them that all of our export revenue comes from small town Alberta, not from the big cities. Is there a question in there, Doug, or just an observation? You think that would work is, is to pull together and put pressure on them from an economic perspective to uh, prevail upon them the importance of having uh, physician services in rural communities to keep the, ec the uh, economic engine flowing. Well, let, let's, talk, let's ask Ed that question. Ed, uh, when you're sitting around the table as a representative of the AMA talking to the government, does that issue come up? Does the government recognize that the doctors are an important part of, of keeping the economic engine running smoothly? I think there's, there's two answers to that. The first answer I'm going to give is having a hospital in a rural community for that industry around the community is actually quite critical. They, they really, a lot of them probably cannot be there without the knowledge that there's a place that their employees get hurt that's close by and close enough to actually provide service. The second one is actually we have, and uh, some of those numbers were always difficult to get, but the Alberta Health Services review that came out. Uh, did it give us some numbers, which were quite interesting. So when they talked about the $880 million in Alberta Health Services that is spent in rural, if you look at that to the $15.2 billion budget of Alberta Health Services, it comes up to just under 6%. Uh, so it's not that big. And they still had cuts in there. So we were trying to put that through, and we worked with the Rural Municipality Association, which, which says that, you know, 26% uh, of the GDP of Alberta comes from rural Alberta. They've done their studies which have shown that. So I have brought that forward to government to say, and they've acknowledged that, that it, you know, that shows the value and the importance of healthcare to rural Albertans and that we are actually are contributing towards receiving that, an equitable part of healthcare. Great. Uh, Jean Barkley, you're up next. If you want to unmute your mic and ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Aisman and Conkin for attending today. It's uh, very interesting as always. Uh, just a very brief background in our community. We've been um, quite proactive on, on this file. Uh, we, we had uh, local physicians come to our council and present. We had standing room only. There was probably 70 citizens jammed into our council chambers where we hardly ever get anybody. Physicians then had a town hall of over 300 people. And uh, Jill and uh, a local doctor presented again last week. So I guess I, I would like to know from Dr. Aisman and Dr. Konkin, how do you make communities realize, I, I think when the issue is in front of them, they're very engaged, but I guess in a broader perspective in this province, how do you make communities realize how serious this issue is? Because I, I don't think people think this will happen in their community. Oh, we, you know, our doctors are great and they'll stay here and, and, um, that they won't eventually, and we're seeing that in some communities already, or some communities, or you know, services have been given up. So, I'm wondering how the AMA can send messaging out where 
you know, the lay people like us can understand it and it gets through to, to the, the greater audience. And I, I see a lot of chatter on Twitter, but it's, it's a lot of chatter between physicians and, and, you know, we don't understand billing codes and all that stuff. So. Gotcha. And if you could answer that question. Oh, that's a tough question to answer because we look at that ourselves. I think that comes back to the you know, that sentiment. Well, you know, maybe those physicians could open, but not, but not my my physician. I think people have to realize that you know that maybe your physician because that somebody else saying the same thing, and you're not their physician. Uh, so I think it is important. I, I think it's also important that just communities know. I mean, the the rhetoric that started this all was how overpaid physicians were in Alberta. I think. When you get into times like this, it, it, it becomes that type of resonance that the government kept pushing out and stating makes it very difficult for patients to hear anything different. Uh, and certainly knowing what's gone on in the Alberta Medical Association, we were talking and recognized for quite some time about the sustainability of the healthcare system. That's what we've been talking about. It benefits us to have a sustainable healthcare system as much as the patients for, for providing service uh, and having a job. And so I think part of it is we have to let our patients know that as physicians, we were willing to be part of the solution and, and, and taking some cuts, but those cuts needed to be looked at in a way that sustained the system and, and provided uh, health care to all Albertans without reducing the, the quality of that health care. And I think that's where it needed a much better approach than unilateral. And I, I'd like you to address this question. Are Alberta doctors overpaid? You know, the, the Alberta Medical Association has uh, looked at that, and it depends on which numbers you take and put uh, together. Uh, certainly, the Alberta doctors are paid more than the rest, and I'll acknowledge that. Not to the extent that they say, but again, as was alluded to earlier, I mean, Alberta has notoriously been more expensive to work in than the rest of Canada as well, and I'm not sure where our politicians rank and, and how they are paid compared to the rest of the country as well. So I don't know that somebody might have the answer to that, but you know, and I, but it's also more, where's that money going to? Like we talked to, you know, so are we putting it towards our overhead and are we adding extra value into the system where it matters? So in family medicine, we're trying to build a medical home, which is actually expensive. It is about hiring more staff and building bigger teams to, uh, support the physician work and in that way is actually support the patient care. Um, so it's a bit of a twist in there. Are we spending the money appropriately? Because we're not pocketing it at all. Um, and also when we get into tough economic times, then you know, I don't think a physician is going to say, you don't touch my pocketbook because you know, if, if there's no system there, we don't have a job. Uh, Jill, I'd like uh, to address a question to you. Now you've got a foot in both the academic camp and in the rural practice camp. And, you know, when you're out talking to uh, physicians, and if you look at the uh, literature, if there is literature on the issue of physician compensation, uh, are Albertan, Alberta doctors just fair, compensated fairly, or are they overcompensated? I would say they are, I would, I would argue that they're not overcompensated. I think Sandy's put something in the chat here to say that until recently, Alberta has been the most expensive province to live in. Um, and so, you know, we, I think part of the problem has been the government has allowed for uh, comparing apples and oranges as opposed to apples and apples. But I, I also think that we need to go back to this, that it... <laughs> One needs to be able to sustain one's practice and to make a reasonable living. I don't think any physician that I know of in rural, at least in rural Alberta, is in it for the money. If you were in it for the money, go do real estate or something. Um, that that it's about what it, it. It's a profession. It's a calling. But you need to be able to pay your staff and you need to be able to have a clinic where people can come to and all of those kinds of things. So I would say that we have been fairly compensated for the last few years. And it's, you know, in my career, sometimes it's been under, sometimes it's probably been a bit more and it's kind of gone up and down. But the tricky piece here is that it's what Ed was saying. And it, I would argue the one thing that I need to point out yes building a patient medical home looks more expensive 
in the long run, it is cheaper. And what the government doesn't understand is that rural generalists in particular, but generalists in the system, are the people that make the system effective and efficient. There is absolutely incontrovertible evidence that building a system on family physicians and the medical home around them has a, it costs less money, but more importantly, patient outcomes are better than if you have more specialists than family docs. So that's the piece that makes no sense to me about what this government is doing. Because everything they've done so far, I'm sorry, not everything, most of the things they've done so far have been about family docs. And those are the people that ought to be the bedrock of this system. I want to ask the question of both of you, and, and maybe we can keep our answers brief so we can get some of the other uh, questions. But, uh, you know, as somebody who doesn't live in the province, but uh, has lived there and in those rural areas well, um, I see government uh, staff, issues managers, press secretaries attacking doctors on, on social media, you know, saying uh, how overpaid they are and, you know, they're shouldn't have Cadillacs or whatever the, the, the tweets are. And uh, Ed, what does that mean to you? When you see that kind of stuff going on, what does that mean to you personally as a physician? Uh, personally, I haven't paid too much attention to that because I'm not on Twitter. So I guess I'm lucky that way. Uh, no time for that. Um, you know, I think it's a personal attack. And I think it's just a, it's an ineffective and poor way of trying to get your point across and trying to have influence on a system rather than providing leadership and working together with other leaders to build a, a proper system. And so that's the biggest disappointment to me that's been going on. Um, you can say all those things, but really you gotta be able to build a system. And I, and I think someone had mentioned somewhere in some of the articles that I read that, you know, when you're into that part of life or you're into politics or, you know, people that work in Alberta health and stuff, they're, they're likely into that time of year where they don't need much health care. Um, you know, unless you're a female, which you might have a, a children, and that tends to be more that you involved in healthcare. But you know, for that general male that's generally healthy without hurting themselves on the weekend wire stuff, you know, tend not to need healthcare as much. And so that's probably our most uh, critics that are out there against healthcare. Uh, uh, excellent point, Jill. What's your take on that? Um, I think we've been seeing, and uh, I, I would agree with what Ed's just said, but I'll add to that, that we're seeing um, a kind of anti-professional, anti-intellectual uh, stream through our culture, society, civil society. Um, and that it, um, as we have built this incredible information age, there's this assumption that because I have all this information, I know I don't need anything more. And I, th I think the, the piece that we've lost is the fact that there are for certain kinds of information, and it isn't just about medicine, but let's start there, that you actually do need some critical thinking skills and some basic knowledge in order to make sense of that. And that I think some of this has been about power. There's no question that in the old days, it used to be doctor was God and you just did whatever you were told, but that's hugely changed. And most of us, um, I hope most of those people are the dinosaurs that have gone, but work with patients. And for those of us who work in rural, work with our communities about what, what works. And here are your choices. I can't make a choice for you, but these are the pros and cons, et cetera. So I think that some of where we are at right now is almost a politics of, of envy or a politics of, of just kind of disregarding the need to understand why, how that information puts itself together. Got you. Uh, Danielle, you're up next. If you could unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Markham. Um, yeah, um, 
as a representative for the nurses with United Nurses of Alberta, we've also seen that vilification of healthcare workers and that denigration of the work that we do in making us out to be greedy individuals at the front line uh, and fat cats. So um, I appreciated your comment, Jill, on in terms of comparing apples to oranges, because absolutely everybody in Alberta makes more and physicians should make more and nurses should make more and everyone who's who's serving the public should be making more as well. Um, I did appreciate uh, the conversation around uh, the value of um, rural communities. Uh, and I think the challenge that people don't see is if it is destabilized, that it will be incredibly difficult to, to get back. So um, I kind of have two quick questions on this, which I think Jill could answer and Ed might be able to add as well. So one was, um, how hard was it to get things back? Because I realized there was some destabilization after the client cuts in terms of um, in terms of physician services, and do we see kind of a similar thing happening again? But also, um, your concept around the structural urbanism was um, bang on as well, and how we can do better in terms of addressing rural specific needs and and what, what we should be asking for around those pieces. Thank you, Danielle. It's very interesting, uh, uh, Jill. Uh, if you want to way in. <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, so I would, uh, uh, I'm going to put it, we lost, we lost thousands of nurses, we lost hundreds of doctors through the Klein era, and huge holes in rural, and we lost hospitals, we lost services. I would argue it took a minimum of 10 to 15 years. So we're just now kind of starting to feel a little bit that things are okay. Um, if we lose, so it won't just be doctors. It will be, as I said before, it'll be the whole team. Um, and I, I think the other piece is, I'm sorry, I'm tangential to think, but it, what, what many people don't get is that it won't just be doctors and nurses and health professionals. It'll be the grocery stores and it'll be the pharmacies and it'll be whatever, because as people travel for health services, oh, well, while I'm here anyway, I'll go to the grocery store or I'll get my drugs in this community rather than that. And that's why the whole idea of the health delivery system as an economic driver in communities is so important, number one. But coming back to, um, oh, sorry, what was your second question? I was going to go on with that, but I should do the second question. Yeah, no worries. Um, around the structural urbanism piece yes. and how we need so, to do a better job. Yeah, that's right. So, and, and in fact, this all fits that that ur uh, urban has always looked at efficiencies and centralization and whatever. Ed alluded to this before, and it's a question I ask because governments have never done this. I don't think they've ever saved any money by devastating rural. You just change the pocket it comes out of. So you close a hospital, who does the traveling? It's rural people who have, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that's one issue here. Um, I don't think they've ever, and it's 6% or less of the budget. So even if you do save a little bit of money, it's peanuts compared to the whole system. But it, it is needing to look at rural in a very different way. So how do you do that? You have rural people at the table. You have rural community members. You have rural health professionals. You have rural sort of health, econ health economists who understand rural um, with the system and the government um, because the, the solutions will be different than those in the city. And I think if we start to push the principle of quality health services as close to home as possible, that that ought to be what happens everywhere, including in urban. And there are some excluded populations in urban that are poorly served by this health system. Um, so I, I, I mean, there are some connections here beyond rural, yeah. but the urban structuralism, or sorry, the structural urbanism is an important concept because it's mostly about the assumptions and the frameworks that are used by urban people and then the whole system has to abide by them. Uh, Ed, uh, do you want to add anything to what Jill said? I think Jill said it right. And I think we're just getting back to where we were at the Klein 
changes uh, going back, but I also think other changes have added, just like I mentioned with the bus service. So that, that adds a different burden to rural and an increased need for physicians. I think some examples you can give is even little smaller types of bits. So if you lose your obstetrics, like we've seen in some rural communities, it, it's not something you just get doctors that want to do obstetrics again to come back, but you also need nurses who feel comfortable uh, in getting that back. And, and if I use nurses as an example for the urbanization, uh, typically your nurse in, in an urban uh, hospital is doing surgery or doing internal medicine or is doing pediatrics or is doing ICU. Uh, your nurse in rural areas doing uh, emergency medicine, doing internal medicine, doing pediatrics, uh, maybe a little bit of ICU, uh, doing labor and delivery, doing it all. But their education that they get from Alberta Health Services is exactly the same. They get, they get to pick a course, but in rural they need to do all the courses. So they get paid for one course, really you do all. So there is that urbanization, even when I look at my nursing colleagues that you know they, they're expected to maintain all those different types of skills, just as we are as physicians. But like the urban nurse, they only get to get one course that's covered and, and supported through Alberta Health Services. So I think that's an example that I would give about the urbanization, where we're not just seeing what's needed in rural, uh, but looking at through the lens of, a, of an urban type of hospital. Great, thank you, Ed. Uh, we've got time for one question, and uh, I'm going to call on Richard. If you can unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Mute. There we go. Hi. Um, again, thanks very much for uh, everybody's time today. Um, so my question was about ARPs. They had been uh, floated as as part of negotiations early on, and uh, I know that uh, some doctors voice a little bit of opposition. Um, and so I was wondering, what is, uh, what do you suspect is the driver for these ARPs and what is driving possibly the opposition or, or what would they need to look like for rural doctors to, to uh, take them more seriously or to prefer them? Uh, thank you. Uh, Ed or Jill, who would like to field that one? I think I could answer that one. So ARPs uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, the idea with government and ARPs is it kind of helps you know what you're going to pay. So it really helps with the budget. And I don't think physicians are against ARPs. Uh, certainly we've been in the section of rural medicine, the section of family medicine, have been trying to work on an ARP type of model for the last uh, five years, even longer. Uh, personally, myself, I'm on an ARP when I do my First Nations work. I'm on the Indigenous Wellness ARP as part, so I do both ARP and fee-for-service. I don't think there's something that, that, that are bad necessarily, but they can't be imposed. And that's the thing. You have to work with it and have a look at it. The other issue that happens with ARPs is it takes a lot of work. It's just not a, a change in how you get paid, it's actually a whole change in how you practice. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, change management and there's a big cultural shift when you look at that. Um, so it's not an easy task. And I think one of the troubles we see in rural is we're so busy, it's difficult to put in. So when I look back in my career, putting in the uh, even electronic medical record, well, it may make sense and it does to me totally now, but that took a lot of effort and work by physicians in the community to, to build that and figure out what we needed. And, and we did hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to sort that out as we added us all together. When we did primary care networks, it was the same. The changes in healthcare that are big like that uh, to eat up a lot of our time. And when we don't have much time, and uh, we're spending most of our time trying to look after our patients, it, it's something that's daunting and difficult. So I think in the rural area, that's more the concern. They've also, historically in the rural area, have always been concerned about the hospital versus the clinic. So if they fairly put the ARP, you may move your patients to the hospital and build them there. And so there's a uh, distrusting their physicians from health and the government. They haven't found a solution for that. They haven't talked to us either. Um, so going to an ARP is going to be a big trust type of thing. Uh, so and Ed, oh. could you tell us what an ARP is for those of us who are... Oh, it's called an alternative relation plan. So it's a different way of getting paid. Uh, and it's done in many different ways. Uh, so the line is more of an hourly sessional rate uh, that I get for the work I do rather than a fee for service. Uh, in other places, uh, maybe a some of the models we have are blended capitation models where, where you get paid for a patient panel, so a group of patients that are, that are under your care. 
And uh, the capitation part is if they don't actually get care from you, but go other places, you're going to lose some of that. Um, and rural is quite difficult with that type of model. Uh, it's okay if you're well serviced with physicians, but if you're not well serviced, uh, you know, you're seeing patients and they may need to go somewhere else once in a while for service. And we have a big population that travels. So they go to Fort McMurray and you get cut there. Uh, Jill, if, uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. If you could uh, address that issue, uh, that question uh, in a br briefly, if you don't mind. So I am on an ARP, an academic ARP. Um, and um, it's also fraud in the sense that I mean, we've been negotiating, renegotiating hours for more than a year. Um, and it's still, uh, there are still some big issues. Um, and so, but the, the, I'll go back to the system thing. I think that's usually why people have me come, is that in some ways it doesn't matter how you pay people. It's where you want, who the outliers are. So there are outliers no matter how people get paid, and this isn't just about physicians. But what seems to always happen is you kind of go after the outliers and the people that are actually doing the work for the reason, you know, because they want to do the work, end up in all of these kind of boxes and rules. And so one of the big difficulties with rural, again, is that people don't understand that most rural docs work in clinics, they do home visits, they work in long-term care facilities, they work in hospitals. And ARPs, the way they were initially set up, were kind of just kind of a one-size-fits-all, either clinical or academic. And that doesn't work. And so the negotiation for trying to sort through a blended system was kind of where things seemed to be headed. But then um, the whole, the other piece here is the whole of the group that worked on ARPs in Alberta Health has turned over. There's nobody there with any history. So it, it, that piece becomes a bigger issue too. Folks, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Konkin and Dr. Asmus for joining us today. You've, this has been a very informative hour. We thank you for taking uh, that hour out of your very busy day. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you very much for coming, folks. And uh, if you want, I, I'm going to put this up on YouTube uh, shortly. And uh, if you could share it amongst your networks, uh, we'd be much appreciated. And uh, thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.